this time for Africa. <laughs> welcome, welcome, one and all. It is me, your host, Shinge Mavima, and I'm so excited to be here. You can tell today I'm doing something a little different. I'm repping that World Cup today, man. I'm tapping into another one of my passions today. Still African history, but I'm tapping into the beautiful game. I love, love, love the game. Um, so today we just had the FIFA Men's World Cup finish in, in, in December 2022. And I thought maybe, what about if we were to do a history of Africa and African teams at the World Cup? Could be a passion project, right? So I've recorded this video for you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. It's a labor of love. It's uh, two hours plus long. So take your time with it. I'm just glad to have made it. I hope you like it, love it as much as I did making it. And if I left anything else out because the, the history is ever so comprehensive, any tidbits that you feel I left out that you may want included in this, please leave them below in the comments. Already I can, you know, once I was done with this, I realized that I had missed talking about Thomas Nkono, who was the Cameroon goalkeeper in 1990, who did so well that the great Gianluigi Buffon of Italy actually named his son Thomas after Thomas Nkono. So that's just an, a, a little story from, from in, in World Cup history and, and African World Cup law that I already left out. There can only be several more, right? The controversy surrounding South Africa's bid, um, which was placed in twenty in two thousand and four for the twenty ten World Cup, which culminated in the 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 the, the prosecution of the likes of Sir Blatter and, and other folks. Also fascinating, also fascinating. But in any case, I won't hold you up much longer. Get into the video. I hope you love it. Share it. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel and yeah, enjoy. Now, before we get to discussing the presence of Africa at the Men's World Cup historically and, and contemporarily, it is important that we introduce this behemoth, the organization that makes it all happen, FIFA. Now, FIFA is an acronym, of course, which is, uh, which is an, and I'm going to try it in, 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 in my best French here. Federacion Internacional de Football Association, right? Which just means the International uh, Association Football Federation. Okay. Um, it was founded in 1904 by... Now, this is debated by seven or eight members, depending on how you look at it. But the, the founding nations are Belgium, Denmark, France, the Netherlands, Spain, Sweden, and Switzerland. Now, this is not the Berlin Conference or the Open Door Notes. This is the founding of FIFA in 1904. The eighth debated position is that of Germany because they sent in a telegram to vote for the founding of this organization, which, again, was to oversee international competition among the national associations. Uh, but because Germany did not have a member there to vote in person, they were not typically counted among the founding members. Right? England would join in 1905 which is uh, interesting because you'll see how England uh, sort of interacted with the World Cup a little bit later. But in any case, uh, the membership of FIFA expanded beyond Europe with the application of South Africa in 1909. So that's the first African country to become a member of FIFA. Now, if you know anything about South Africa, especially in 1909, it might as well have been a European outpost, at least the nation that was officially recognized as, as South Africa, right? Might as well have been a European outpost. So what it really means for Africa, eh? But it joined in 1909. Argentina in 1912. Canada and Chile in 1930. Then the U.S. in 1913, 1914, right? So there we go. The organization is afoot. At this point, the Olympics have already been a thing, right? The Olympics have already been a thing. And they have a football tournament there. So FIFA proposes, comes to the Olympics and says, you know what, why don't you let us organize and host the football, soccer part of the Olympics? And the Olympics agreed, they defer to them on this. So beginning in 1920, FIFA would organize a tournament, a soccer tournament within 
the Olympics. And in 1920, the first one uh, was won by Belgium. In 1924, Uruguay won. And in 1928, Uruguay won again. So Uruguay is turning out to be to be the move here, right? They are the undisputed best team of the 20s, right? So FIFA sees that it's going well and they decide, you know what? Let We can do this ourselves. We don't have to do this under the umbrella of the Olympics. So in 19, after the 1928 Olympics, they approach the Olympics and tell them, you know what? Going forward, we're going to be doing our own thing. And thus, the inaugural FIFA tournament was hosted in 1930. Because Uruguay was, the again, the best team, the, the back-to-back champions of the Olympic tournament, it uh, was uh, FIFA decided that the World Cup would be hosted in Uruguay. The 1930 World Cup would be hosted in Uruguay. Now, as you can imagine, for something of this scale, right, the first tournament, that 1930 tournament, was shambolic. <laughs> it was shambolic. This was this one was strictly by invite, so there was no qualification process. Um, but the choice of Uruguay as a venue for the competition meant a long and costly trip for the European teams, right? Which remember they were just dealing with the Great Depression at the time. So no European country actually pledged to send a team until two months before the start of the tournament, when then FIFA president uh, Rime sort of uh, prodded them to 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 come. And ultimately, of Belgium, France, Romania, and Yugoslavia who came. And in fact, Uruguay, the small country of Uruguay, ended up subsidizing those trips. And ultimately, 13 nations participated in the World Cup. Seven from South America, four from Europe, and two from North America. Right. So where are the African teams? Well, there was only one African team that was invited to this, and that was the Pharaohs of Egypt. Right. Um... However, their boat coming from Af- uh, from Africa, right, was slowed down due to the, to a storm in the Mediterranean Sea, and they missed their connection, so they never made it to the World Cup. That's Africa's first foray into the World Cup, right? So the first World Cup was, even though sixteen teams had been invited, ended up being just competed in by thirty by thirteen teams, and of course, Uruguay won that. And what would become a trend in those early years? Egypt was the only African team to apply to feature for the 1934 World Cup, which was held in Italy, in Mussolini's Italy, right? And this was the first World Cup with qualifiers. They were looking to to get 16 teams over there. And since there were 32 teams qualifying, um, you know, there was a round robin sort of established by FIFA through which they would qualify. Egypt was placed in a group with Turkey and Palestine, right? Turkey withdrew from this tournament and Egypt just had to beat Palestine to to, to qualify. So Egypt beat Palestine 7-1 in Cairo at home and 4-1 in Jerusalem, the Holy Land, beat them in the Holy Land. Uh, and so they qualified for the 1934 World Cup, so the first African team to qualify for the World Cup. So, and at the time, the World Cup was organized on a straight knockout basis, right? So, Egypt played against Hungary in, in Naples, uh, where they lost 4-2, with Abdul Rahman Fauzi scoring a brace. He scored two goals to become the first African player to score at the World Cup. He also scored a third, but it was disallowed, even though he had dribbled the field from halfway and still continues to be controversial to this day. But in any case... Abdul Rahman Fauzi scored two goals in the first match by an African team at the World Cup. They lost 4-2 to Hungary. Um, and the significance of this, right? They wouldn't have known this at the time, but Egypt would be gone from the World Cup for 56 years after 1934. So do the math. They wouldn't play in the World Cup again until 1990, right? And African teams as a whole wouldn't play again in the tournament for another 36 years, 1970. But they had broken into the onto the world scene with my man Abdul Ra- Rahman Fauzi scoring twice. In 1938, what happens in that gap, that, that long gap with African teams? Well, let me take you there. In 1938, 
Egypt was again the only African country to apply to compete in the World Cup. Uh, but they withdrew before playing any matches. And here's why. It's a crazy reason. Egypt were supposed to play Romania to quali in a qualifier for the World Cup in, in December of 1937. However, Egypt told FIFA, right, that this was during the month of Ramadan, the Islamic fasting month of Ramadan, and they didn't want to play the match during that month. And FIFA was... You know, FIFA was sort of on the fence about this, right? Should we allow this? However, their chances of getting approved were blown out of the water, right? When Egypt invited Austrian side Vienna FC to play an exhibition match during the same fasting period. Think about that, right? So while FIFA is still mulling over the decision whether they should postpone the match because it's Ramadan... Egypt goes on and invites an Austrian team to play them during that. So the FIFA was like, oh, you can actually play, right? And after that, uh, Egypt was, uh, was, was ejected from the World Cup, from the World Cup qualification. So no African teams in 1938. Then, of course, you know, 42-46, uh, the World Cup is suspended. Uh, I think there was, a, there was a war or something happening. You know, Hitler, Mussolini. Uh, you know, Roosevelt, Churchill, and those guys. You might have heard about it. I think they call it the Second World War or something. <laughs> no, but seriously, the, the Second World War was a big disruptor. And coming back from the World War, the first World Cup coming back from there was supposed to be held in 1949. But again, it was taking a little bit of time to, to prepare for it. Uh, so it was finally handed to Brazil in 1950. Again, because of how shambolic it was, and a lot of teams actually did not m make it to this World Cup, right? Because a lot of countries were unprepared, still coming, smutting from the war. Germany and Japan were banned. A lot of Italian players had died in an air crash, right? Several other teams, such as the Soviet, the Czechs, Scotland, Turkey, France, all decided to pull out. Countries are still building from the Second World War, uh, Interestingly, though, this was England's first World Cup uh, appearance. They hadn't participated in the other World Cups because they did not want to play against the countries that they had fought against in the First World War. And also, they just thought of the whole FIFA thing as a joke. You know, this is our game. It's coming home and all that nonsense. Shout out to my English subscribers, though. <laughs> in any case, so no African teams participated in that tournament. 1954, Egypt was still the only African team that applied to compete at that World Cup. They had to play a, a playoff against Italy. They lost home and away, so they didn't qualify again. But 1954 is a pivotal year in the history of African football. At that year's FIFA Congress, Sudan, Egypt, Ethiopia, and South Africa, interestingly, who were then the only members of uh, of African members of FIFA spoke about their plan to create CAF, the Confederation, uh, the Federation of African Football. I recognized them right there and then as one of the six regional zones, right? A lot of people weren't having it and leading the charge was Argentina, who felt that, uh, you know, the seeds being given to Africa and Asia and FIFA were not reflective of the quality of football in those continents, right? You felt, they felt that the... So this was a big struggle. But in any case, uh, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan all applied to enter the qualification process for the 1958 World Cup, right? Ethiopia's entry was rejected uh, together with South Korea. Now, the reasons for this I couldn't really find. So that left two African teams to qualify. For the first time, we had more than one African country more than just Egypt qualifying for the World Cup. And it, it had initially been Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan. But Ethiopia was now out, so it was just Egypt and Sudan. Now, the qualification for the 1958 World Cup was beset with problems, right? A lot of them relating to Israel's participation. Now, I hear you uh, asking, right? Israel is not in Africa. Why would this be relevant to this world? Listen to this. Egypt and Sudan competed in the Africa-slash-Asia zone with 10 Asian countries for one spot at the World Cup, right? So these 12 countries would be competing for one spot at the World Cup. 
At that time, Israel was classified as an Asian team and uh, was drawn to play qualifiers with, with, within those 12 teams, right? Rest of the second round of those qualifiers after Cyprus withdrew, then they themselves withdrew. Sudan also defeated Syria, but eventually withdrew in protest to having to play Israel. <clears throat> That's the same reason Egypt had withdrawn as well. Time and again, the Israeli opposition, and success, successively it was Turkey, Indonesia, Egypt, and Sudan withdrew, right? And what do those countries have in common? Turkey, Indonesia, Egypt, and Sudan. All majority Muslim countries, right? So they withdrew, refusing to play Israel on p political grounds. Uh, if you can imagine, Israel at this point is no more than 10 years old, the, the modern state of Israel. And it's been lambasted by its neighboring states, uh, as well as the large, of which Egypt is, is one such state. Uh, but also uh, the global, particularly the Muslim community in the world, right? This is something that you may still run into even today. Uh, for example, uh, Iranians are still forbidden from competing against Israeli opponents in any sport, right? And there was a recent wrestling case or something to this effect. So, so Israel, therefore, took the spot for the Asian African teams without having kicked the ball, right? Because all these teams refused to play them. But FIFA's rules prohibited any team that was not a host or a defending champion from qualifying without playing a game. So Israel ended up having to play against Wales, which was the best non-qualified team uh, from Europe for that World Cup. And they lost to, to Wales. Um, and Wales qualified to that World Cup in 1958, which was their last time at the World Cup until 2022. So fascinating stuff here. So again, no African teams at the World Cup in 1958. Basing on their reaction to playing against Israel, it would seem that the advocacy tone among African teams was getting louder at this point. And that is with good reason. Remember in 1957, CAF had finally been founded. Ghana had gotten its independence leading to an upsurge in Pan-Africanism and nationalism, the first sub-Saharan African country to get its independence, right? And there's a great quote here quoted in, in, in Peter Alleges' book, and he's quoting historian Eric Hobsbawm, who says, The imagined community of millions seemed more real as a team of 11 named people. What is he talking about here? As the African countries that have been colonized for the past um, half century to a century start to get their independence they are, the, the, the nation that they are founding is very much an imagined community right which goes back to uh, Benedict Anderson's theory of imagined communities what do I mean by imagined well consider Zimbabwe for example I'll just use that because that's near and dear to me there is no previous nation known as Zimbabwe which incorporates the the Ndebele people, the Shona people, uh, in their various sub ethnic groups, right? The Tonga people, indeed, even the European settlers who were there. We are really imagining a new nation at this point. So, just to boil that down to eleven representatives on the soccer field is 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 became sort of cathartic and almost something that we can live the nation vicariously through, right? So something so. And I'll continue to quote Peter Alleghi for a little bit here. Uh, As part of the new of this political project, many African governments built new football stadiums in their capitals. In a departure from the few colonial era stadiums, smaller facilities, usually with one grandstand and overall capacity of less than twenty thousand spectators, independent African stadiums were large modern cathedrals of sport, symbols of modernity and national pride. Then he goes on to list a little bit later where uh, how a lot of the stadiums, soccer stadiums that were being established bo bore some sort of shout out to independence, including Independence Stadium in Accra, Ghana, and Lusaka as well. 5 July Stadium in Algiers, Algeria, shouting out their Independence Day. And 28, 28 September Stadium in Conakry, which is the date of independence. Stadium of the Revolution in Brazzaville, Congo and simply National Stadium in Lagos, 
Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. Right, why have I gone through all this? Just to show you that at that turn in the, in the late 1950s, as independence is afoot across the continent, there's a certain level of activism and nationalism that becomes attached to football, right? Indeed. And going forward, you know, as we qualified for the 1962 FIFA World Cup, seven African countries entered that qualification process. And these were Ghana, which was recently independent, the United Arab Republic, which, who knows what this is. This was a unified, uh, this was the brief union of Egypt and Syria, right, uh, which lasted from 58 and 61, so they, they, they entered the qualification as, as one country. Uh, Egypt was the more dominant part of that, right, that's Abel Nasser, yes, so it, it qualified through the African qualification. Ethiopia, Morocco, Nigeria, Sudan, and Tunisia. So who's missing from this list? If you guessed all the countries to the south of Africa, you're right. And we'll talk a little more about that a bit later. Uh, both Sudan and the UAR withdrew from the qualifications because FIFA would not allow them to rearrange their matches to avoid the monsoon season. Man, there were all sorts of things to consider in the past, wasn't there? Um, so Ethiopia had qualified through the, tried to qualify through the, the European, the UEFA, uh, and so they got eliminated. So only four teams went in uh, into this. And this is interesting. I won't spend so much time talking about the qualifying process going forward, but I th just thought this was interesting to share, right? Morocco and Tunisia beat each other 2-1 at home, right? Home and away. So they were tied at 3-3. And they played a third match in a neutral location in Italy, which ended 1-1 after extra time. So these teams were evenly matched. So guess how that was decided who would go through? This is before penalty shootouts were, were technically invented, quote-unquote. Um, so Morocco advanced by drawing lots to eliminate Tunisia. This still happens in some form to this day, right? But they qualified by drawing lots and eliminated Tunisia. Then they went on to eliminate Ghana for the final uh, qualifier. Then eventually they met up with Spain and all that for nothing because they ended up losing to Spain. So again, no African team qualified for the 1962 World Cup. Now, back to why there were no Southern African teams uh, at that point, right? South Africa notwithstanding. We'll, we'll talk about South Africa's uh, complex situation just now. But 1960 is widely regarded as the year of Africa because that is the year that a lot of African countries got their independence, right? The French... Uh, generally pulled out of Africa, so a lot of uh, former French colonies got their independence in 1960. Uh, the Congo is coming too, um, as well, right? Countries like Ghana have already got their independence in the 50s, but like 60s is the year that a lot is happening. I think Nigeria gets its independence that year as well. But for Southern Africa, the countries, you know, apartheid is still very much a thing in South Africa. Um, Rhodesia is still under the, the the Central African Federation, which had in Southern Rhodesia, Northern Rhodesia, and Nyasaland is still a unit. And even though Nyasaland and Rhodesia, uh, Northern Rhodesia will get their independence in by 63 and 64, uh, Southern Rhodesia, which became Rhodesia at that point, starts to exist in a pseudo-apartheid situation after it's after the settlers secede from the British Empire. The Portuguese territories of Angola and Mozambique uh, are still colonies right until the 1970s. All this to say, you know what? A lot of those countries, they'll get on board later, but but just not yet. Now, now back to the World Cup. 17 African countries entered the qualification process for the 1966 World Cup. Think about that, right? From 1954, we had one still Egypt, 1958 we had three, 1962 we had seven, and now we have 17 African countries, right? A lot of them former French colonies, which include the likes of Guinea, Mali, uh, Senegal, right? South Africa even entered this, right? This qualification process. And again, I told you we'll get into more detail about this. Um, but French Congo was kicked out. 
and South Africa was was uh, was suspended for apartheid, which resulted in their qualification. So that left the rest of the you know fifteen African teams to qualify. In January nineteen sixty four. FIFA decided that the lineup for the 16 teams at the World Cup would include 10 European teams, four Latin American teams, and one from uh, North America and that Central America region, CONCACAF. That left just one place to be fought for by three continents, Africa, Asia, and Oceania. Now remember this, that it was already tough when there were only 12 teams qualifying for that Africa-Asia zone. Now, the 17 African teams, even more Asian teams, and of course New Zealand, Australia are trying to get in on the mix too, right? So, so, CAF, right, Confederation of African Football, felt this was deeply unfair, and rightfully so. And the, and the situation was further complicated with uh, how FIFA was dilly-dallying about South Africa uh, over apartheid. In October of 1964, all 15 African, African countries withdrew from qualifying. Other World Cups have seen individual teams refuse to go, but 1966 in England was the only one to be boycotted by an entire continent. Ghana, back-to-back African champions in 1963 and 1965, were the biggest losers here uh, with their team, which was highly regarded with some people even suggesting that they could have won the whole thing. Now, that may be a little bit far-fetched given the fact that we only just got Africa's first semi-final list in 2022, but who knows, right? In any case, they would have made some impact. I would be remiss if at this point I didn't at least mention Don Eusebio, right? Don Eusebio, the Portuguese legend. He was, however, born, raised in Mozambique. He moved to Portugal. And he went on to score nine goals in this tournament in one of the most phenomenal World Cup performances we've ever seen, uh, which still ranks among the top five halls in, in a single World Cup, right? I think there's Juice Fontaine of France, who has uh, 13, the likes of Gerd Muller at 10. But Eusebio has nine goals in a single World Cup, which is something we haven't seen in a, definitely not in my lifetime, right? The likes of uh, Miroslav Klose, and Brazilian Ronaldo came closest. But in any case, Don Eusebio representing Portugal. But indeed, uh, we can start to see the, the potential for African brilliance here. And speaking of African players representing the, 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 the colonial powers or former colonial powers, it is worth noting that as early as in the 1950s, um, we would see... West African and Equatorial African players being subsumed under the Grand France project right up until independence, right? So that is to say France had a, syst a colonial system of direct rule that was somewhat different from, from the British system in which the colonies acted as somewhat provinces of of, of, of Grand France, if you will, so they would incorporate these players. This is important to this day, right, when you see the makeup of the French team to this day. And, you know, I think the, the team that played in the World Cup final, by the end of it, was all people of African descent. And we're not talking about people of African descent going back, uh, who have been French citizens for decades, right? It's, it's all people who are either immigrant to France or second generation for the most part, which is a different conversation unto itself, but we can see that it has its roots in the grand France project of, uh, of, of the colonial era, indeed. Let's talk a little bit about South Africa, right? Now, South Africa, the apartheid system in South Africa was put in place in 1948, right? The apartheid system which legalized, codified, racial segregation the actual term means the separate development of different racial groups but all it means really is it codified the marginalization of of black people uh, of, of indian people of what they call colored people in south africa right in 1955 they were suspended for for this racial discrimination right this is only seven years after the establishment of apartheid in 1956 a FIFA commission 
of inquiry upheld the decision to suspend them. The Commission of Inquiry accepted, however, SAFA, which is the South African Football Association's argument that racial segregation of sport was South Africa's tradition and custom. <laughs> uh, FIFA's preferred approach was to encourage SAFA to merge with the South African Soccer Federation, SASF, which represented the black football clubs. SAFA represents the white football clubs. It's the official, quote-unquote, uh, representation of the, of the white nation, right? And so, what did SAFA say? Well, they said no. In so they are suspended. In 1958, more pressure was put on the South African government to, to deracialize sport, but the government remained unmoved by the growing international pressure against apartheid sport. Now remember, this is after Ghana had become independent, so a lot of African countries are also starting to pile on the pressure and the global community as a whole. This international hostility was demonstrated when the Brazilian football club Portuguesa withdrew from playing against an all-white South African football Durban team. Right, The South African government insisted that the Portuguese team should drop its black players <laughs> when playing against... Isn't that crazy? They're not just talking about segregation in South Africa itself. But if you're going to come and play in South Africa, you have to drop all your black players as well. So Brazil said, you know what, screw it. I mean, the, the Portuguese team out of Brazil said this. In 1961, South Africa was expelled from FIFA. And man, the black community, the anti-apartheid movement, the African community as a whole celebrated this. However, in 1963, talk about some of those tensions that I was talking about earlier. South Africa was readmitted into FIFA, but it was expelled once more after it proposed, listen to this proposal here, that they would send an all-white national team to play in England in 1966 and then an all-black national team to play in Mexico in the 1970 World Cup. So after that, FIFA was done with them, and beginning in 1965, South Africa would be suspended right up until the end, towards the end of the apartheid era in 1992, when they were finally admitted into FIFA. Right? And also, when we think about, so this is important here, because when we think about South Africa being sanctioned with divestment in the 80s, uh, with uh, with even the ban from the Olympics, with the, with the rugby bans and so forth. All those things came after this moment. So here we see again uh, soccer, football, and particularly the World Cup being a huge impetus towards social change, right? For better or worse, but in this case we can definitely say for better. And that's the story of South Africa and the World Cup. We'll get back to them when we get to the 1990s, indeed. Now the roaring 60s have been and gone, the high point of anti-colonialism, right? A lot of African countries have since got their independence. Uh, we're talking about countries like Zambia, uh, Malawi, uh, several others, Tanzania and so forth, Kenya. They have since got their independence. Now, South Africa is still banned, still going through apartheid. They'll be doing that for the next couple of decades. Rhodesia is a white settler colony. They are still allowed to go to the qualifiers, though. But they're still a white settler colony at this point. The Portuguese territory is uh, Mozambique and, 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 and Angola and Southern Africa, as well as Cape Verde and, uh, and Guinea-Bissau are also still colonies. But for the most part, a lot of African countries have become independent and thus are now competing for, to qualify for the World Cup. Now, remember that boycott in 1966 when they were protesting the fact that African countries had to compete not just with each other, but with Asian and Oceania countries for one World Cup position, one World Cup spot? Well, that has changed now. The boycott paid off somewhat. What do I mean by somewhat? Well, there is now one guaranteed spot. <laughs> For African countries, right? One guaranteed. They're not competing with Asia and Oceania anymore. They just have their one guaranteed spot. And 14 African countries entered this the, the, the running for the 1970 World Cup. And ultimately, Morocco qualified. Guess what? Guess who they played in the last playoff match to 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 to, to make it to the World Cup? They played against Tunisia. <laughs> 
And guess what? They were tied again. Remember we spoke about how they had to draw lots earlier? This time, this was decided by way, by, by virtue of a coin toss. And again, Tunisia lost. They must feel very uh, cheated. Or, 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 or they might just jinxed by the Moroccans, right? But remember the Moroccans didn't make it to the World Cup last time, even though they made it to the final hurdle against Spain. This time, because there's now a guaranteed African spot, Morocco actually makes it to the World Cup. Crazy, right? But there's another African country that almost made it to the World Cup. And this is Rhodesia. Why is that, Shingi? You, I hear you asking. I got you. I got you. So Rhodesia, remember, remember I just explained that pseudo-apartheid system that they had as a white settler colony in, 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 in Southern Africa, right? Modern day Zimbabwe. They were expelled from the Confederation of African Football, CAF, for having a white minority government. And so entered through the Asia-Oceania qualifying group. Africa now had its guaranteed spot, but Asia and Oceania still had its, its own qualifying group. Where they had to play Australia, in, in, and this time they played it in, in Portuguese Mozambique, right? This is before Mozambique became independent. So they could play there. They were not allowed, to, they, they, there was a boycott against playing matches in Rhodesia because much like South Africa was being boycotted, a lot of countries are now boycotting Rhodesia as well. Now, the first two matches were drawn, thanks in large part to the excellent Rhodesian goalkeeper, uh, Robin Jordan. And, and they're playing in Mozambique, right? And the desperate Australians hired a Mozambican Sangoma, right? Sangoma, uh, traditional healer, witch doctor, call him whatever you want, to curse Robin Jordan. In the third match, <laughs> Jordan was taken off injured after a collision with another player and Australia went on to win 3-1 the last qualifying stage of the World Cup they end up getting they end up refusing to pay the medicine man right the Mozambican medicine man the Sangoma and he is irate at this so he curses them livid he curses them and two weeks later Australia goes on to play Israel in the final qualifier and they end up losing Crazy story is they end up not qualifying for the World Cup until the 2006 World Cup. And hear this, uh, a po prominent Australian comedian, John Safran, has a series called John Safran vs. God or something in the early 2000s at which he does different sacrilegious things or, or pseudo-religious things. And one of the things was to go to Mozambique in 2004 where he tries to meet the Sangoma, but the Sangoma has since died, right? The medicine man has since died, but he meets his successors, and apparently the curse is lifted. And Australia qualifies for the World Cup in 2006. Now, I don't know how superstitious or religious you all are, but that is a pretty interesting tidbit. In the meanwhile, meanwhile Rhodesia's calf expulsion was soon followed by a FIFA expulsion, and Zimbabwe was eventually readmitted in 1980. Right. So that's a fascinating little tidbit about the qualifiers. But let's talk about how Morocco performed at the first World Cup back. The first time a non-Egyptian team has been to the World Cup. The first time in 36 years an African team has been to the World Cup. So Morocco was placed in this group with uh, West Germany, Peru, and Bulgaria. Right? They lost the first match to West Germany, 2-1, lost 3-0 to Peru and drew 1-1 with Bulgaria. So, point, that draw with Bulgaria um, became the first ever point that Africa earned at a World Cup. Indeed. So, fascinating. So, Africa's back at the World Cup. In 1974, 24 African countries, right? This is the first time we've had more than 20 African countries still competing for that one place. Uh, enter this grueling qualifying um, qualifying round, and ultimately, Zaire, right? Now known as the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Zaire, who were the African champions at the time, 
end up qualifying. And they qualify comfortably. And this is important. Scoring 18 goals and conceding 5 on their route to qualification. Or route to qualification. So, for the 1974 World Cup, Zaire is placed in Group 2 alongside Brazil and Scotland. And Yugoslavia, right? Those three countries. And they play against Scotland, which at the time was a, was, was a powerhouse, a firebrand team with the likes of uh, Kenny Douglas, right? Dennis Law, this sort of, this sort of big hitters. And, they, and Zaire lost 2-0 to this great team. Incredible, right? You know, this is, you know, it's not a win, but they played very well. In fact, the Scottish centre have Jim Houghton said after the match, let's face it, we underestimated them. For 15 minutes, I wondered what the hell was going on. Where the devil had this lot come from, playing stuff like that. I wish I'd put on my Scottish accent there, but I don't really know where to start with it. So what am I saying here? Zaire, they give a decent showing against one of the better teams in the world. Their next opponents, however, they played against Yugoslavia. And Yugoslavia was onto them, right? Yugoslavia was onto them. Before that match had happened, and after the Scottish match, a dispute about match payments broke out in the Zairean, among the Zairean players, with many players believing that the officials from their country had taken the money, <laughs> right? some of the uglier parts of African football that we're still contending with today. Chaos broke out among the squad and they were eventually each given 3,000 Deutschmarks by FIFA. FIFA had to come in to bail, it up, bail them out, which convinced them to play because FIFA, they couldn't risk spoiling their reputation uh, with teams sort of storming out of the World Cup mid-tournament. So what happened in that game? The Yugoslavia team was not supposed to be better than the Scottish team. And the Scottish team, remember, had beaten Zaire 2-0. So what happens here? Within 20 minutes, Yugoslavia was up 3-0. Then things took a turn for, the, turn for the worse when their first jo choice goalkeeper, Kazai Mwamba, was replaced by Tubilan Ndimbi, who was only 5 foot 4 who was a friend of one of the Zaire officials, and uh, the official was was in attendance and wanted to see him play. Sure, dude, right? Five foot four at the World Cup as a reserve goalie. Come on now, I'm not being high test here, but you know. Um, and the team goes on to lose, not four zero, not five zero, but nine zero. Now, Zaire at this point is under the rule of Mobutu Sese Seko. Right one of the worst dictators known to African rule. And I know some other dictators, people debate their legacies, but I think Mobutu is one of those guys that universally nobody likes. So Mobutu was furious here. He had done a whole big thing before they went there uh, to, 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 to celebrate them, had them off at the royal palace and so forth. He was furious. Such was his anger Mobutu's anger that he ordered several of his personal bodyguards to go to Germany where the World Cup was and threaten the national team. They, 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 and they did, telling their squad that if they lost by more than three goals to reigning world champions, Brazil, in the last game, they would not be allowed back into the country. So, allegedly. So now we come to the second half of the, of the second game, uh, of the final game, sorry, against Brazil. And... Mo and and Zai and Brazil are leading 2-0. Not quite the landslide it was against Yugoslavia, but it's 2-0. And the players are starting to panic, right? They're fearing for their life. They've been told they, they can't go back home. Um with uh now Brazil was lining up around the 75th minute, right? They're lining up for a free kick, and one of the most wildest World Cup moments happens. I'll put it on your screen here, where they're lining up for a free kick, Brazil comes, and a player, um, Ilunga, Ilunga from the Congo, or from Zaire, just steps out of line and boosts the ball when it's supposed to be Brazil's free kick, right? 
What just happened here? Does this guy Mwepu Yulunga not know the rules? Right? He receives a yellow card for interfering with a free kick. And uh, ultimately, the game ended up 3-0. Now, that thing about Mobutu Sesoseko saying you can't come back unless you concede 3 is disputed. In other places, it says 4, which seems to be true because they ended up being able to come back home. Um, so what happened here? A lot of people immediately believe that this African guy did not know, this Zairean guy did not know the rules and that's why he kicked the ball, you know. But think about this. 24 African countries tried to make, had entered the qualification and they had made it, scoring 18 goals, conceding only five. They had beaten Morocco, who was at the last World, who had been at the last World Cup and fared very well. How would they not know the rules, right? What are we actually saying here when we suggest that they, this guy, Mwepu Ilunga, did not know that when it's a free kick, you don't kick it out yourself, right? Clearly, what people did not know was this backstory that I gave you, which tells us that there was some other stuff going on here. He was frustrated. They were nervous. He was trying to stall for time. That's why he kicked the ball. Here, here, here's a quote. Uh, from a publication, I'll put the link in the in the in the description. And I quote: However, Ilunga will always be remembered for the moment in the final group stage match when he sprang out of the defensive wall at a Brazil free kick and booted the ball down the pits. Universally ridiculed ever since, his apparent rush of blood was actually intended as a protest against the decision of President Joseph Mobutu or Mobutu Sese Seko. Uh, not to pay the players as well as threatening them, right? And I quote him here. I did that deliberately, Ilunga said in an interview in 2010. I was aware of the football regulations. I did not have a reason to continue getting injured while those who will benefit financially were sitting on the terraces watching. I know the rules very well, but the ref referee was quite lenient and only gave me a yellow card, right? So that's Zaire left the World Cup with no points having considered 14 goals in their three matches. And also this ended sort of like a golden period in which they had been crowned African champions in 1968 and 1974. So this is a very dear point in African history, to in African World Cup history to me, because it, it was one of those things where it was used to placate or to play into the racist, racialized stereotypes of Africans not knowing what's going on, even when they are part of the process. When clearly something else was going on here. There's some other African decadence, of course, we can talk about with the officials taking the money and Mobutu Sesseko's tyranny. But Mwepu Ilunga not knowing the rules is not one of those things. That's got the story of 1974. So, and also in this case, we've seen the third African team qualify and the first one from Sub-Saharan Africa. In 1978, even more African teams, 26 this time, Try to qualify for the for the World Cup, and ultimately, it was uh, Tunisia this time. Uh, you know, eliminating Morocco in the first ever penalty shootout in World Cup history. This relationship between Morocco and Tunisia and the qualifiers is the is the stuff of of rom coms, right? The first time they met up, it ended up being lots drawn. The second time, it was uh, a tossed coin, and Morocco won both those things. And in the first ever World Cup uh, qualifying penalty shootout, they meet again, and Tunisia finally wins. How do you think Tunisia must have felt about that? Man, if only the, we had had penalty shootouts in those last two times, we would probably have gone to the World Cup anyway. So anyway, Tunisia qualifies the Carthage Eagles, right? That's their nickname. They go over there, and this time they are playing against West Germany, right? Poland and Mexico. That's the group that they were in. So after Zaire had been humiliated in 1974, people were thinking that, oh, these African teams are soft. You know, people weren't really expecting much from them. Especially this group is pretty solid, right? West Germany, Poland and Mexico. So they were down 1-0 uh, down to Mexico. Uh, at halftime, when their coach who was also Tunisian, uh, Chetali told them that they treated their opponents with too much respect 
and they could still win the game if they tackled hard and imposed their belief and self-confidence. So coming out of this pep talk, the North Africans, right, to the Carthage Eagles, scored three times to win 3-1 against Mexico. They became the first ever African team to win a game at the World Cup. Morocco had been the first one to draw a game, right? Egypt had been the first one to score in the first ever in the second World Cup in 1934, but this was the first time an African country had ever won a game and that was against Mexico in 1978. And the scorers on that day, I think they, they bear mentioning here. Uh, Ali Kabi scored the equalizer to make it 1-1. Nejid Gomid grabbed a second in the 80th minute. And Mokta Dub scored the third goal, right? So indeed, they ended up losing the next match to, to, to Poland 1-0. Okay, and drew against West Germany in the last game, a 0-0 a zero, zero game. So, only lost one game, uh, but this was not enough to qualify for the second round. However, you can tell here that Africa, African pride had had been restored. Africa can actually play, right? And Africa had gotten its first win at the Men's World Cup. Now we venture into 1982, where... A very, very fascinating World Cup for several reasons. For starters, up until now, the World Cup has been, of, for, for the past over 50 years, since the beginning, the World Cup has been designed for 16 teams. This is the first time that the World Cup expands to 24 teams in 1982. And based on the decent performance of Tunisia in the last World Cup, Africa's representation of the World Cup is double. Now we have two representat two representatives. Cameroon and Algeria qualified this time, right? Cameroon for the first time. In fact, Algeria also for the first time. Uh, but you can tell here the early dominance of, of North African teams in the World Cup, right? Um, because compared to... This is just the, the, the second sub-Saharan African country Cameroon is. Uh, but we're already at the, at the fourth... North African team, right? Which, think about it, there really isn't a lot of North African teams. Right now, the only one that's left maybe is, is Libya. That's the only one that hasn't qualified at this point. But anyway, Cameroon is in Group A, where they are playing against uh, Peru, Poland, and Italy. They go undefeated in the group. So that means they're going to make it to the second round, right? Well, actually, no, because they, are, uh, they were undefeated. They drew 0-0 with Peru. 0-0 with Poland and 1-1 with Italy with Gregoire Bida scoring uh, the one goal in the draw against Italy. So although they had a goal difference of zero, um, Italy had also drawn three times but had a better goal difference. Cameroon was eliminated. Now this was especially harsh because uh, in that match against Peru that they drew 0-0, Roger Miller, right now remember that name, Roger Miller, had, had a goal wrongfully disallowed for offside. So that was tough, but Cameroon had entered the, the chat now, right, in 1982. The second incident involved, the, then Algeria's run is actually the stuff of legend and really changed the way the World Cup is held going forward. Two with West Germany, big team, Austria, also solid, and Chile, who are no pushovers. They had just hosted the World Cup in the 70s. So, they go on to produce a major upset in that first match. And when they beat West Germany, the giants of West Germany, right? Then, and the goals in that match were score, scored by Raba, Maje, and Lagda Bellumi. They lost their second match 2-0 to Austria, right? Then they produced another surprise when they beat Chile 3-2 in the final game. Now the day after that, so now they, they've won two matches. The day after that was the final group game, which was going to be between West o Germany and Austria, right? Knowing that a 1-0 or 2-0 win for West Germany 
would result in both European teams, West Germany and Austria, qualifying at the expense of Algeria on goal difference. So West Germany scores after 10 minutes and then both teams appear to pass the ball aimlessly around for the remaining 80 minutes. This is known as the disgrace of Dijon, right? Because that's where the match was played. But Shingi, what do you mean the disgrace of Dijon? How do we know for sure that this was a collusion? Here's a comment from the Scottish ref who was refing that game. It changed football forever. What happened that day embarrassed the organizers of the World Cup so badly they changed the rules to make sure it would never happen again. They couldn't risk putting on another game that was remembered as so notorious. And I'll tell you what the changes were shortly. Again, after Ru Horst Rubes, the German scored the decisive goal after 10 minutes, the and the following 80 minutes were played out at a snail's pace. The game was characterized by neither side attempting to score, content to pass around the midfield or back to the goalkeeper. Opta, right, soccer fans don't know what Opta is, they keep the statistics of what happens in the games, have kept statistics for every game, uh, every World Cup match since 1966. And in this match, they are telling, there were three shots in the whole game, none on target outside of the goal. West Germany made eight tackles or one every six minutes. Both sides had an overall pass completion ratio in excess of 90%, a rate that is rare today for even the best and was unheard of in those days. Austria had a 99% success rate with their passes in their own half and West Germany was at 98%. Insane numbers. The performance was widely deplored by all observers. The Spanish crowd was yelling, Fuera, Fuera, which is out, out, while angry Algerian supporters waved bank notes at the players to suggest that the game was fixed. Uh, even the, two si the fans of the two sides were disgusted with an Austrian television commentator advising viewers to turn off their TV sets and a German television commentator refusing to commentate further and a German, German fan burning his national flag in protest. Can you imagine that? They were so upset, even though they were going to qualify, but they knew what was happening was disgraceful. Right? BBC described it as follows. Quality players who should all be in the book of referee Bob Valentine for bringing the game into disrepute. This is one of the most disgraceful international matches I've ever seen. Right? In German, this moment is known as the non-aggression pact of Gijan, which is uh, a shout out to <laughs> to World War II politics, right? And in the English speaking world, it's simply known as the Ansklus, which is a reference to the German annexation of Austria before World War II. Furious Algerian football officials lost an official protest, but the two teams denied any collusion, as nothing could be proved, right? Even though we could see it, and the two teams had technically broken no rules, FIFA allowed the result to stand, and so after that, FIFA did change the rules. In future World Cups, which you will very well know as a standard today, the final two games in each group are played simultaneously. Thus, Algeria were eliminated from the 1982 FIFA World Cup at the first hurdle, despite getting two wins, right? Which right now... Two wins almost always guarantees you uh, a, a place in the second round. So this is shameful, but it was also the first time that an African team had won two games at the World Cup. 1986 would be special, right? For, for a few reasons. Remember, beginning in 1982, the World Cup had, had been expanded to 24 teams, okay? So, to qualify for the second round would be making it to the last 16 for the first time ever in the history of the World Cup. And fascinatingly, in the qualifiers, four North African teams had made it to the final qualifying round. Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and Morocco. So make no bones about it, historically, the North African teams have been very dominant. Now, and these teams that I just mentioned are, are mainstays in the World Cup, with the exception of Libya, which has fallen off in the past 30 years or so. But at the time, so those four were, 
you know, had made it to the final round of the qualifiers. And um, ultimately, Algeria beat Tunisia to qualify, then Morocco beat Libya. So it was Algeria and Morocco at the at the World Cup. So we've seen Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, and Egypt at the World Cup already. Um, and as for Sub-Saharan Africa, we've just seen the uh, Zaire and Cameroon at this point. Now, that will change later even though the North African teams have continued to perform very well, but a lot more sub-Saharan African teams would also get involved. That dynamic that I'm establishing is also very important, When you, again, to emphasize there's only six or arguably seven North African teams, right? So the fact that four of them have made it, while there's two out of more than 45 uh, sub-Saharan African countries, right, have only made it at this point. It's, it's, it's a pretty fascinating dynamic at this point. In any case... So Algeria and Morocco go off to the World Cup. Morocco draws with Poland, 0-0, draws with England, 0-0, and then defeat Portugal in the third game. Right? Incredible. And they become the first ever team to, to go to the second round. Now, Algeria doesn't have uh, th th that much luck. But in any case, it's important to emphasize here, Morocco becomes the first team to make it to the second round, to the last 16 of the World Cup. It won't be the last time that uh, that Morocco makes an African record or makes a World Cup record as far as African teams go. So, in the second round, they ended up facing uh, West Germany. And while the, uh, the Moroccan goalkeeper Badu Zaki played excellently and kept them in the game with, uh, with a series of, of, of excellent saves, German legend who had come in as a sub in Gihon, uh, Lothar Mataus, right? Contemporary fans maybe even be familiar with him. He played right up until the early 2000s, I believe. And uh, came in in the 87th, you know, came in and scored in the 87th minute. And Germany, West Germany, won 1 0 and went on to, 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 to play in the finals of 1986 again uh, before they lost to Maradona and the Argentinians had been groundbreaking for African football and for Morocco with them qualifying to the round of 16, the second round, 1990 would go even a step further. Now, two African teams qualified, as was status quo at this point, to the World Cup, Egypt and Cameroon. Egypt was over there. Um... They qualified in a group with England, Netherlands, and Ireland. That's a stark group, man. That's a crazy group. And, and in fact, this group was so tight that out of the six games played in that group, five of them were draws. So that's one of the most tight groups in World Cup history. Egypt drew 1-1 with Netherlands, 0-0 with Ireland, then lost their final match to England. And Egypt's only goal of the tournament was scored by uh, Magdi Abdelghani. I guess the Netherlands in the in the in that draw, and Egypt was eliminated from the World Cup, right? Meaning, <laughs> as of 1990, remember this is that this is that long break from from the the 56 years we spoke about. This was their great comeback, you know, to the World Cup after after 1934, and they also still didn't haven't won a match at this point. Cameroon are without a doubt. The story of the World Cup of 1990, without a doubt, right? In their first match, Cameroon, they've already been to the World Cup. Remember, we saw them in 1982, uh, where they were eliminated uh, in the first round. But in their first match, they shot uh, Argentina, who are the defending champions, by the way, Diego Maradona and them, by winning 1-0 through a goal by Francois Oman Biyik. Even though they finished the game with nine men. And that part is right about Cameroon. <laughs> so they defeat Argentina 1-0. In the next match, they come up against Romania. And they beat Romania 2-1 thanks to two goals from 38-year-old substitute Roger Miller. Now, if you remember earlier in the video, I mentioned Roger Miller uh, because he had come in and... He had a goal disallowed against Peru, which many people feel like was uh, was wrongly disallowed. 
1982, but he was already kind of getting up there. He was 32 in 1980. He was 30 in 1982. So now he is 38, and he comes on as a sub and he scores two goals. Incredible. So now they, you know, with the two wins, they've already qualified to the next round, right? Um, then they finally their third game they lost. 4-0 against an already eliminated Soviet Union. So, you know, they were playing a, a, a gear down because they knew they'd already qualified to this round of 16. Now, remember, this match, this loss against the Soviet Union is their first actual loss in the World Cup because in 1982, they drew all three of their games, right? Then they've won their first two. So this was the, the last year. In the second round, Cameroon goes on to defeat Colombia 2-1 with again Roger Miller coming off the uh, coming off coming on as a second half substitute to score twice famously dispossessing uh, uh El Loco I think they called him Rene Higuita was the Colombian goalkeeper if you remember him is the guy with the scorpion kick and the crazy hair I uh, you know he, but because he played so eccentrically he was dispossessed by Roger Miller who goes on to score two goals and by the few, this is the point where Roger Miller's famous post goal dance with the other corner flag uh, became synonymous. And it's arguably, I think, the most popular World Cup uh, celebration ever, at least in the top three, top five for sure. Indeed. So he's got four goals off the bench at 38. Incredible, incredible. Roger Miller. I don't think the World Cup legends come any bigger than that. In the quarterfinals, with like seven minutes left, there were there were seven minutes from qualifying for the semifinals. Then England were awarded a penalty. Um, then England went on to win three two after extra time, uh, with two of the goals coming in as as, as penalties. So this is how the scoring went. David Platt scored first. Then Emmanuel Kunde with a penalty, right, to equalize. Then Eugene Ekeke, three minutes later, takes the lead 2-1 in the 65th minute. Then a penalty in the 83rd uh, by Lineker, right? Then, uh, then so it's 2-2 two -two and they're going to the extra, into the extra time. Then Lineker gets another penalty, or England gets another penalty, and Lineker scores again another penalty to make it to the... To the semi-finals so so close seven minutes away from qualifying to the semi-finals insane right because up until now remember we've been talking about the dominance of the north african teams but now we have a west african team that has entered the foray and they come this close to making it to the semi-finals that's 1990 it wouldn't be another 32 years 32 years before an African team finally made it to the semifinals. But it's not the last time they would come agonizingly close. But we'll get to that. In 1994, the number of spots for Africa in the World Cup goes from 2 to 3. Now, this is on the strength of Cameroon almost making it to the semifinals and the fact that the teams in recent times, Morocco and, and, and Egypt in the last World Cup, had, 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 had comported themselves pretty well as well. And this time, more and more African teams are qualifying. Remember, we went from Egypt being the only one signing up for the first three or four World Cups, then to, to three with Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia, which, by the way, interestingly have fallen by the wayside now. We don't hear about them at all, right? To three teams, to seven, to 17. Now, 40 teams entered the qualification for these three spots by 1994, right? And uh, there's a very sad story here. In Group B, right? Because in, in that Group C, I was talking about was Cameroon, Zimbabwe, and Guinea. In Group B, a tough group, there was Morocco, Senegal, and Zambia. Now, in the first match, Morocco beat Senegal. In the second match, Zambia were going to face Senegal. 
However, the plane carrying the Zambian team crashed on the way to Senegal, to Dakar, on 28 April 1993. And the crash, which is uh, blamed on uh, mechanical problems and pilot error, killed all 30 people on board, including the entire team that was on board, and coaches, support staff, and the plane crew. Only two European-based players from the original squad missed the flight. Charles Musonda, who played for Anderlecht, who was injured, and Captain Kalusa Bralia, who played for PSV Eindhoven and was flying from Europe to join the team in Dakar. Sad, sad, sad moment. Incredibly tragic moment. So all the matches in the group were postponed for the month, which doesn't even seem like, a, like, like enough time. But Zambia put together a new team, which was captained by Kalusa Bralia, and they actually went on to defeat Morocco in Lusaka in the first match with the new team, with Kalusa Bralia and Johnson Bralia, who they are not related, though they have the last name. However, they lost the final group match to Morocco, and uh, Morocco went on to qualify. Fascinating stuff, because Zambia would go on to qualify for the African Cup of Nations in 1994 and make it all the way to the finals with a team that has been hastily assembled after the entirety of their team except two players had been killed in a plane crash. So not only is that a loss of so much talent, the very uh, cream of the crop, it is also... Can you imagine what that does to the spirits of the folks? Maybe that buoyed them. Maybe that's why they performed so well. But that's for the African Cup of Nations. Now back to the World Cup. Um, <clears throat> so we have Cameroon. We have uh, Morocco who made it. Then we have uh, Nigeria who also make it. And in Nigeria, this was the standout African team of the tournament, right? Uh, they were in Group D at the World Cup, where they first played against Bulgaria, who Bulgaria, by the way, went on to make it to the semi-finals, and Brazil, uh, Nigeria beat them 3-0. Then they lost 1-2 to Argentina. <clears throat> then they went on to beat Greece 2-0. And in a crazy, this again, this hardly happens, right? Nigeria, Bulgaria, and Argentina all finished on six points and all qualified for the second round because they would do the third place, third fi uh, place finisher would also qualify. So those three teams made it. In the second round, <clears throat> Nigeria faced Italy in the round of 16. Emmanuel Aminek has scored in the 25th minute um, and with two minutes to go, right, Roberto Baggio equalizes to make it 1-1. And then Baggio scored again in extra time for Italy to go through to 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 the to the to the quarterfinals, eventually making it to the to the finals where they played Brazil. So that's interesting. Again, Cameroon had come this close to making it to the quarterfinals, and Nigeria was two minutes away from from making it to the to the to the second round in their first ever World Cup. This was the third successive World Cup where an African team progressed beyond the first stage. Morocco in 1986, remember, was the first one. Then Cameroon making it to the quarterfinals in 1990. And this was a major factor in FIFA increasing Africa's allocation from three, five, three, to, three to five spots as the World Cup expanded to 32 teams in 1998. In 1998 holds special sentimental value to me it is the first world cup and i'm dating myself here it is the first world cup i'd watched a little bit of the 1994 world cup you know but as a as a as a, uh, as a picking but it's the first world cup that i can say i watched and remember in great detail it's probably the world cup maybe that and the 2002 world cup that i remember in some great detail even more than more recent ones so and uh, and of course 30, you know, a lot of African teams tried to qualify, but eventually five teams made it. Cameroon, who had already been there and made it to the quarterfinals in 1990. Morocco, who qualified 
several times and had been the first team to make it to the second round. Nigeria, who had qualified for the first time in 1994 and made it to the second round, coming agonizingly close to the quarterfinals. And Tunisia, who was back to the tournament uh, after, you know, they were the first African team to ever win a game at the World Cup back in the day. So they're back now. And there's a new team too here. Dum, 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 dum. Yeah, my final fans will, will, will know what that's a reference to. That's South Africa making their debut at the World Cup. Remember they've been so banned from FIFA for decades and they were only readmitted in 1992 and they came came out guns blazing. Right. In, f in fact, their name Bafana Bafana means the boys, the boys. And they were initially named that because when they played against some of the bigger teams in the region, uh, in the in the continent, Cameroon and so forth, they were just losing left, right and center. So it was almost like men versus boys. But they soon repropriated that and started playing some sweet, sweet ball. And in 1996, they had actually won the African Cup of Nations. Incredible. Y'all remember that team, man. That's the team with uh, Mark Fish, uh, Lucas Radebe, um, the likes of uh, Dr. Kumalo, uh, Mark Williams, right? Andrea Renze. Uh, but now they've qualified to the World Cup for the first time. Incredible comeback story. This is all part of their great comeback because also think in rugby, they'd had that Invictus moment in 1995. So really... The, the, the Rainbow Nation, Bafana, Bafana, Mzanzi, South Africa is back. And if you can tell, I love South Africa, man. It's problems notwithstanding. But in any case, they are back. And the five African teams all took European coaches. Yeah, three Frenchmen, one Serb, and one Pole, uh, making it the first time since 1974 that there was no African coach at the World Cup, which... You know, some people will say it's whatever, but I'll also say this, that no World Cup winning team has been coached by a coach from a different country, right? Not yet, anyway. It hasn't happened. So there's something to be said for that. And the same, I think, goes for for, for, for the Euros as well, indeed. But the, the, the tournament was pretty fascinating, and I'll go through it in some detail here because I remember a lot of this uh, since I was, like I said, it's the first one that I watched. In Group A, Morocco played very well. This is the era of Mustafa El Hajj, I believe he was the talisman, where they drew their first match in, against um, Norway, then lost 3-0 to Brazil. Then the last two matches were played simultaneously because Lord knows you don't want the disgrace of Gihon happening again. <laughs> and with the last 10, with 10 minutes to go, Morocco was leading Scotland 2-0, while Brazil was leading Norway 1-0. And if that had stood, that would have meant that Brazil and Morocco go through. But Norway scored twice in the 83rd and 88th minute to beat Brazil 2-1. So even though Morocco ended up winning 3-0 against Scotland, it was Morocco, it was Norway and Brazil that qualified to the second round. Once again, an African team had come within the last 10 minutes, in this case, 7 minutes, to qualify to the second round. And in this case, it hurt more because they, it wasn't them letting it slip. You know, it was uh, Brazil that let it slip. Cue the conspiracy theories, which at the time made sense to me. But now I don't see why Brazil could have possibly been interested more in Norway making it than, <laughs> than in, you know, than in Morocco making it. In group group uh, group B, uh, Cameroon didn't perform too well, but there's one record that, that that's worth mentioning it because in the group B in the last match against Chile, Rigobert Song, who was the coach at this World Cup of the 2022 World Cup, legendary uh, Cameroonian defender Rigobert Song became the first man to pick up red cards at two World Cups. He had been sent off again as a 17-year-old <laughs> against Brazil in 1994. Which, remember, in that tournament where they go, got to the quarterfinals in 1990, in their first match against uh, Argentina, they were down to nine men. 
So Cameroon does this, man. I love them, but they do this. So Rigobert Song would be the first man. Imagine ending a red card against Brazil at 17 years old, then doing it again four years later. The second man to be red carded twice at the World Cup, anyone want to take any guesses? Is not an African, not at least not an African in terms of who he represents at the World Cup. It's a great Zinedine Zidane, Zizou, <laughs> indeed. Um, in Group C, right, South Africa began their World Cup campaign, right, their first ever World Cup game with a 3-0, host, uh, 3-0 loss to France, who, would go on to be the, who were the host and the eventual champions. There's a very interesting conspiracy theory about a player named Pierre Issa who played in that in that in that South African team. I think he had an own goal considered a penalty, but he's of French descent, you know? So a lot of people felt that he was a double agent. <laughs> Make of that what you will. Look that up yourselves. I you know, I don't buy it. I think he was just bad or just was unlucky. But in any case, that's been posited. Then the, South Africa went on to draw 1-1 against uh, Denmark in the following game with Benny McCarthy, right, who would go on to, to play for Blackburn Rovers, uh, win the Champions League with Porto, uh, ben, um, Jose Mourinho's Porto. He scores his first goal in the World Cup. So they needed to win big against Saudi Arabia in the third game to make it to the second round, but they drew 2-2. Uh, against Saudi Arabia where they gave away two penalties and only equalized in the injury in injury time with a penalty from Sean Bartlett so not a bad first outing two draws right and if they could have won one of them they could have possibly made it to the to, to the second round group D now that's the team uh, Nigeria Nigeria this was a great outing here they beat Fancied Spain 3 2. That's Spain with um, Hierro, Raul, and the likes. Then they beat Bulgaria 1 0. Then in the third game, they sort of take their foot off the pedal and they lose 1 3 to Paraguay. But they make it to the second round together with Paraguay. So they qualify to the second round and they face up against Denmark. Right? So they're looking pretty good. But Denmark was hard. This was the era of Peter Schmeichel, who was the father to, to Kasper Schmeichel, who we may, younger uh, viewers may be more familiar with. Brian Laudrup, the Great Dane. Michael Laudrup, right? These players, this is, the, this is peak uh, Denmark. And now, Nigeria were, were no slouches either, right? As the team with people like Nwanko Kanu, JJ Okocha, so good, they named him twice. Uh, Sunday Olise, Finidi George, a few of those players have been on that Ajax team that won the the Champions League a couple years earlier. Babayaro, Babangida, they had Peter Rufai in goals, man. Stop me, stop me. Uh, who else? Taribo West in defense. So, love that team. But they ended up losing 4-1. Man, I remember that match. So keenly, it's one of the games that is just stuck in my head because there was so much hope and, and optimism, but ultimately the, the, the Danes came out on top. In Group G, Tunisia lost their first two matches, 0-2 and 0-1, uh, right, uh, to England and Colombia respectively. Then they drew 1-1 with Romania. The only reason I think this is even worth mentioning is because this is so Tunisia, right? A record like that, 2-0, 1-0, then a 1-1 draw at the end. Is typical, and you'll see that as we go through the years. Um, you know, they might have like a 1 0 win in there, right? Indeed, but uh, yeah, so they were eliminated. Thus, two of Africa's five representatives came away with at least one win. However, there was an African representative in the second round of the World Cup for the fourth time in succession. Remember, we had uh, Morocco in 1986. Right, played very well. We had Cameroon in 1990 making it to the quarterfinals and within a few minutes of the semi finals. Then we have had Nigeria in 94 and 98. So Nigeria are looking really hot as we go into the 21st century. The 2002 World Cup was held in Japan and South Korea, and this was crazy. 51 African countries entered the qualification process for five spots. Remember, 
Remember that it was one team just 50 years ago, 50 years before this, right? And three, and then seven, then 17. Now 51, virtually every country on the continent enters these qualifiers. It's insane. And in fact, uh, for the five qualifiers though, sort of starting to show the, the dominance of certain teams, four of the five teams that made it to ni the 98 World Cup, South Africa, Nigeria, uh, Cameroon, and Tunisia qualified again. The only new team was the Lions of Teranga, Senegal, right? That qualified for the first time. So they, they came in in place of Morocco. They qualified in place of Morocco. So, like Cameroon 12 years earlier, remember Cameroon had done this against Argentina. Senegal started the tournament with a shock 1-0 win over the defending champions, uh, France this time, right? You might remember. I also remember this game keenly. I remember getting picked up from school and going straight to the couch to watch this. Papa Booba Diop, right? The wardrobe, as they called him, may he rest in peace, scores the, 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 the one goal to defeat France. And remember, France is Senegal's former colonial master, if you will. So this game also has some geopolitical weight to it, right? So after that, after beating France 1-0, they go on to draw with Denmark 1-1, and Denmark go on to win the group. But they draw with Denmark 1-1. Then in their final group match against Uruguay, crazy game, they were leading 3-0 at halftime, Senegal was. Then in the second half, the South Americans, right, Uruguay, gets it together. And they end up drawing 3-3. Crazy match. One of the all-time great World Cup matches. A little bit sloppy in the second half from Senegal. Maybe the nerves got the best, best of them. But in any case, that was enough for them to qualify to the second round. They knocked out France, right? And also, Uruguay, you know, both former world cup champions with one of them being the defending champions so uh senegal qualifies to the second round and in the second round they are drawn against sweden right in the round of 16 they are they are drawn against sweden and Andri kamara scores in the 37th minute then uh, sweden equalizes then the go match goes into extra time and Henri Kamara comes back up and scores the winning goal. Incredible match. Incredible match, right? So they qualify to the to the quarterfinals. The second African team since their West African neighbors Cameroon made it. You know, you look at their flags the wrong way, you might even think it's the same country. <laughs> but in any case, so they qualify and they ended up meeting up against Turkey, and they ended up getting eliminated by a golden goal four minutes into extra time. You all remember the golden goal? This is when, if a team scores, the game ends right then. So, and that's how they had won. That's how Senegal had won in the, in the round of 16 against Senegal. They don't do that anymore. And Turkey did that to them in the quarterfinals. So, so close, right? Ended up losing in, due to this golden goal right at the death. So what up? Uh, of Africa's five representatives, right? Three won at least one game, which is more than the two from the from '98, but only one progressed to the you know into the second round and made it to the quarterfinals. Which means that that's the fifth time in a row that an African team had made it to the round of 16, and the second time an African country had reached the quarterfinals. <clears throat> this time, as opposed to the to the first time uh, to '98, sorry when all five teams were coached by Europeans. This time, three of the five teams took a local coach to the World Cup. Jomo Sono in South Africa, Festus Onigbinde in Nigeria, and Ama Suya in Tunisia, right? And also something to, that stands out in this tournament is El Haji Diouf. You all remember El Haji Diouf um, from Senegal made it into the team of the tournament, right? Uh, his post-tournament record the less said, the better, but he made it into, into the team of the tournament, and he played very, very well. In fact, between 2000 and 2002, 2003, he was great. I'm surprised that Henri Kamara didn't make it into this team, though he had played very well. And I remember that team as much as I remember the Nigerian one earlier that I spoke about, Tony Silva and Goal, 
uh, Duff in, in defense, Fadiga, Aliu Sise, who's their coach, who's, who was their coach at the most recent World Cup and has been their coach for a while now. Uh, Papa Buba Diop, El Haji Diop, Andri Kamara. Uh, I think there's a couple of Kamaras in that team. So, so stellar team, really, indeed. Very good showing, and they'd matched the best finish ever in, 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 in the World Cup by an African team by reaching the quarterfinals. Now, unlike 2002, where four of the teams had played in the previous World Cup and Senegal was the only debutant, in 2006, four out of the five teams were debutants to the World Cup, right? Had never played in the World Cup before, right? And that's Ivory Coast, okay. Togo, Angola, Ghana. Can you believe Ghana is making it to the World Cup for the first time here? And South Africa. Um, we'll just talk about a few of the results here. Um... Ivory Coast, well, before we get to the tournament, before we get to the tournament, something seismic happens, right? Where, as the teams are trying to qualify. On 8 October 2005, Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, played against Sudan uh, in a qualifier. And ultimately, right, as results in other places went their way, um, they qualify. Cote d'Ivoire qualifies to the World Cup, their first ever World Cup. That's Drogba, um, that's the Torres, um, who else would have been on that team? Uh, Ebue, right, is, is that collective, Diabate, uh, and, and so forth. So they qualify. I think Sheikh Tiote as well may have been on that team. So they qualify to, to, to the World Cup, and as they are having a press conference, they are doing a press conference. Uh, they begin to celebrate wildly, but it wasn't long before Drogba's attentions, as they celebrate during the press conference, turned to the civil war that had been raging Cote d'Ivoire since 2002. So speaking after the match at this press conference, Didier Drogba, arguably, you know, he's in the conversation about the greatest African players of all time, right? He's one of the names that comes up consistently there. And he says in French, Men and women of the Ivory Coast, from north, south, center, and west. We prove today that all Ivorians can coexist and play and, and play together with a shared aim to qualify for the World Cup. We promise you that the celebrations would unite the people. Today we beg you on our knees. And as he said that, the players fell onto their knees. The one country in Africa with so many riches must not descend into war. Please lay down your weapons and hold elections. And he finished. Now, remember, Drogba is not even the captain at this point, right? But but he took it to themselves. Then the players started to sing, we want to have fun, so stop firing your guns. Now, this these words had, like, significant effect, eventually helping the two warring sides to the negotiating table where a ceasefire was signed. And that wasn't the year, end of it. Of this, the, follow, the, the, the year after the World Cup, um... While touring the, 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 the rebel held north of the Ivory Coast, uh, Drogba announced the national team's match against Madagascar on June t 2007 will be played in the rebel stronghold of Buake. And being from the south himself, it was an attempt to bring the nation back together. It was very successful at the time, with a 5-0 victory against Madagascar capped by Drogba scoring the final goal to cause uh, celebrations across the whole country. So this is not to say this brought enduring peace. There's been more uh, conflicts and, and schisms since then in Côte d'Ivoire. But think about the power of this moment, right? This World Cup qualifier in which Drogba and the team got on their knees and, and begged their country to come together and the impact that they had. That is far more important than, the, than their actual performance at the World Cup, which we can now talk about now. So Ivory lost his first two Group C matches. Ivory Coast lost his two, first two group matches to Argentina. 1-2 to Argentina and 1-2 to the Netherlands. Then coming back from 2-0 down against Serbia and Montenegro, winning 3-2. Right? In Group D, Angola, which was the only African team with a local coach, Luis Oliveira Gonzalez, lost their first, first match 1-0, right, to Portugal. That's their former colonial masters. Drew 0-0 with Mexico and 1-1 with Iran. So, 
They didn't make it to the second round, but they comported themselves well. In Group G, Togo actually made more news of the pitch with disputes about team bonuses, right? Harkening back to to Zaire uh, some time ago, uh, which caused the coach Otto Fister to walk out on the team um, just before the first match, and he eventually came back. And Togo ended up losing one two two um, to South Korea, two zero to Switzerland, and also two zero to 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 France. So they lost all three games. Tunisia. Remember that what I was talking about about how their goal, score lines are so typical, and they're always in like Group H or Group G for some reason. Two two, Tunisia drew two two with Saudi Arabia, lost three one to Spain, and one zero to um, to Ukraine. So you know two draws and a w- and uh, two win- losses and a draw, sounds about Tunisia. Now the only team to make it to the to the round of sixteen in this World Cup was uh, Ghana. Which uh, they, they they began with a two zero loss to Italy. Who Italy would go on to win, right? Uh, then they went on to beat the Czech Republic two zero, and then also beat the U.S. two one, which starts some pseudo rivalry between Ghana and the U.S., which will be played out over the next few World Cups, uh, whenever the U.S. can make it. <laughs> uh, that's so so they qualified to the second round and makes it the sixth successive time that a, a, an African team had made it to the last 16. They lost 3-0 to Brazil in the round of 16. So while for the sixth successive time an African team had made it to the round of 16, Africa remained the only continent outside of Oceania to never have two teams reach the round of 16 at the same World Cup. Because in 2002, Asia had done that with South Korea and Japan as their host post-qualifying. Even that will soon change, though. Uh, but we'll get to that shortly. But for now, let's talk about the 2010 World Cup. Cue the Vuvuzelas. <laughs> the 2010 World Cup deserves a little bit of a rewind. We can take it all the way back to the 1960s, 1950s, when South Africa was suspended, then eventually banned from FIFA because of uh, for, for apartheid concerns. Then it comes back in 1992 and earns the moniker, the boys, the boys, because they're like boys playing against men. They were so bad. Then they get it together and in 1996 with Mutelezi, uh, Neil Tovey, uh, Eric Tinkler, Lucas Radebe, that team ends up winning the African Cup of Nations. Then they qualify to the World Cup in 1998, and even though they come out in the first round, they comport themselves decently. They qualify again in 2002. Um, then in 2004, they go up to... They put in a bid to host the World Cup. Now South Africa... Is a is a compare comparatively advanced uh, society in in the in the continent, definitely in the region, right? They'd also hosted the the rugby World Cup, that Invictus World Cup. So they have some some infrastructure, though they would need a lot more to host the far bigger soccer World Cup. They put together a star team, and in two thousand and four, the team contains uh, Danny Jordan, who was the chief executive. Uh, Irvin Koza, these are some big names, right, in the in the soccer f- uh, world that are in the football world that are leading the the bid to host the World Cup in two thousand and the, the, they're bidding to host the two thousand and ten World Cup, but this is happening in two thousand and four. But they also bring us some heavy hitters, man. There's the South African president at the time, Thabo Mbeki. There's uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner and anti-apartheid hero Archbishop Desmond Tutu. May his soul rest in peace. And of course, the big man himself, Uma Diba, Nelson Rohila, Mandela, also on the committee, right? And they're going up, and I think it had been decided that that World Cup was going to go to Africa. South Africa had gone up against Germany, uh, Germany to host the 2006 World Cup, and they'd lost out by just one vote. This time, they were up against Morocco and Egypt. And boy, was it was it, was it heated. To this day, 
you know, some things haven't really been resolved. But ultimately, South Africa got 14 votes, Morocco got 10, and Egypt got none. The World Cup was coming to the Cape, was coming to South Africa, was coming to Zululand. So the World Cup in 2010 would take place in South Africa. Host nation gets a buy into the tournament. You can't have the tournament without the host nation. This was the one World Cup with six African teams, right? Because South Africa was already in. Then there was the five that qualified. So in addition to South Africa, we had Nigeria, right? Remember Nigeria, Algeria, Ivory Coast, and Cameroon, and Ghana. So no new teams, right? All these teams have been to the World Cup before. In fact, a couple of them, Nigeria, Cameroon, and Ghana have made it to, to the last 16 at some point. So, and South Africa, if you remember that first game against Mexico, where they drew 1-1 and that opening goal by Spiro Chabalala, man, that drove the crowd wild, didn't it? Incredible goal. It's one of the best stars to a World Cup tournament that I remember. And I may be biased, but it seems like a lot of people get good vibes from that. They ended up drawing that match 1-1 though, um, before losing 3-0 to Uruguay. And even though they won 2-1 against a, a capitulating French team, right? Which France had this thing where they do well one World Cup and, 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 and struggle in the next one. Even though they did that, they got four points. It wasn't enough for them to qualify to the second round. So Mexico and Uruguay ended up qualifying ahead of them. And South Africa, in so doing, became the first World Cup host to be eliminated in the first group stage. On one hand, that is obviously not great. But on the other, they comported themselves well and they hosted this tournament very well. And they were not a bad team. They were no Qatar. I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's eliminated from the first round. But they played, they played well. However, and other teams, that the rest of the teams too, with the exception of Ghana, were also eliminated in the group stages. Nigeria, Algeria, Ivory Coast, and Cameroon. However, Ghana progressed beyond the group stages for the second time in a row and defeated the U.S. 2-1 after extra time in the round of 16. Remember I told you that there was that rivalry between the U.S. and, the Ga and Ghana that it started in, in, in 2006? It, conti it continues here and it really sort of hit fever pitch here. So they make it to the quarterfinals, becoming the third African nation to do so after Cameroon, Senegal, and now Ghana. Very fascinating given the early dominance of the North African teams, right? The, that I've hampered on a lot about. But it's also interesting that the first three African teams to make it to the quarterfinals had been uh, West African teams. Very, very interesting dynamic. Um, of course, that would soon change uh, as recent uh, results show. But in the quarterfinals, one of the greatest World Cup games of all time. You already know what I'm talking about. Uruguay versus Ghana. Incredible match. Incredible match. This says this is the best match ever played in the World Cup. I'm not fighting them. I think that the most recent final between France and uh, Argentina is, is it might be number one. But this is an incredible match, right? Remember... The first World Cup on African soil. All the other African teams have been eliminated. Ghana is our last hope. The continent has rallied behind this team. And they are playing well. <clears throat> and in that first half, just before the referee blows the first whistle, my man Sally Montari from Ghana scorches one out from distance, right? A grounder, all right? From outside the box and beats Fernando Muslera of Uruguay in goal. It's a great goalkeeper. We come back into the second half. Is Ghana going to be the first African team to make it to the semifinals and do it on African soil? Right with the Vuvuzelas blaring in the background. Second half, Uruguay gets a free kick. The great Diego Forlan. 
who I believe wins the golden boot in this tournament. Gets a free kick from distance. And boy, does he take that shot. And he beats uh, Richard Kingston in goal for, 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 for Gada. Incredible goal to match the first incredible goal by Salim Montari. It's 1-1. One, one. And it goes into extra time. It's looking like it's headed to penalties, right? But Ghana hasn't given up yet. At this point, Ghana hasn't given up yet. Their captain, Stephen Appiah, mighty, mighty man. He drives the team forward, right? Gets into the box. Dominic Adia, right? Takes a shot in the box. He beats the goalkeeper. And on the line, the shot is blocked. Right? And... It comes back that it's been handled. It's Luis Suarez, who is another legendary Uruguayan player, right? But whose reputation for all his brilliance is sort of uh, compromised by biting people and also this incident. But it's, it's seen that he had used his hands to block the ball. The ball doesn't go in. So what happens? He is red carded. He breaks into tears. There's just a few minutes to go in extra time here. He's in tears, right? He's red carded. He's saved his team in the moment, but he, has he let them down in the long term because it's now a penalty? But what was he going to do, right? Because the ball is going in, certainly. So he's walking off the field. He's in tears. Asamojian, who's been on fire in this tournament. Again, one of those World Cup legends. You think of people like Memo Ochoa. You think about Roger Miller. These players who show up at the World Cup. And you may not even know where they play their club football. And really care like that, you know. But he was there. He lines up to take the penalty. Now, this is not news. And if I'm making you relieve this, I apologize. He strikes it with venom. As a Moajian, baby jet. And strikes it against the top bar the the crossbar the top of the crossbar boom it goes out of play suarez who's been red carded but hasn't left the field uh in town hasn't gone to the locker rooms yet turns around and celebrates like crazy oh boy and ultimately the team goes to the penalty shootout and the, the Ghana ends up losing out in the penalty shootout with Sebastian Abreu of uh, Uruguay sealing it with an audacious Panenka style, you know, Panenka style. And, uh, oof. That was tough. And I don't think, if you saw the most recent World Cup, 2022 World Cup, you can say that Ghana and Uruguay, you know, maybe now, but Ghana still hadn't made peace with this they were in the same group and even though neither of them qualified to the second round to the round of 16 Ghanaians still celebrated like crazy because they had played a role in preventing uruguay from uh, from you know how spiteful you have to be <laughs> to celebrate that we didn't make it ourselves but we we're so glad you didn't make it we're gonna celebrate like we did incredible so that ends the story of Ghana at the 2010 World Cup. The World Cup itself was incredible. Uh, a fantastic World Cup. South Africa put on. You know, the, the, the facilities were, were flawless. Some people feel some type of way about the Vuvuzelas. Eh, it, it, it is what it is. It's part of that process. It's part of their, their ambience. It's not as if they caught on and you see them everywhere now, right? Came only the third World Cup to have more than 3 million visitors uh, come to the country for, for the World Cup. And actually, even though it was in 2010, it actually had a a, a larger number of total attendance and uh, average attendance per game than Russia some eight years later. So an all-round incredible World Cup. The 2014 World Cup played in Brazil also marked another landmark for African teams at the World Cup. It was the first time that more than one African team 
finally qualify to the round of 16, right? So while Ghana and Cameroon both collected disappointing results, apart from Ghana's 2-2 draw with uh, Germany, Germany went on to win the tournament. We saw Ghana become the only team in the tournament not to lose against the Germans in the entire tournament. So that's got to count for something, right? Even though Ghana also played the US of A in the, in the third world, straight World Cup that they've played against the US, and this time they lost 2-1. Uh, remember that uh, Clint Dempsey and, uh, and uh, Joshua Brooks, while Ghana had uh, equalized with Andre Ayo. Um, so, indeed... But, uh, you know, Cameroon was meddling and eventually ended up fourth in the group, even though they had done it. Ivory Coast were also knocked out in the first round after a last-minute penalty kick against Greece and ended up third in Group C above Japan, who they defeated 2-1 in their first match. I remember that Japanese match because Drogba, who's now getting older, the legendary Drogba, but he comes on, I think they were down 1-0, he comes on, the cheers... Just as Drogba walks up to the sideline. What a cult legend he is. It was raucous. But he comes in and immediately gets in the mix of things. And they end up winning 2-1. Um, so that would have been a good team to qualify. But they didn't. Africa's pride, however, was saved by both Nigeria and Algeria. Nigeria had kicked off their Group F campaign with a disappointing 0-0 draw against Iran. Then they beat uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Then they lost 3-2 to Argentina in their final match. Also start, you're continuing another rivalry because remember Messi likes to score against Nigeria. So this continued that. But th So they collected four points which, which was enough for them to qualify for the second round, the round of 16. The third time in their history, remember 1998 and 1994. Now Algeria lost to a strong Belgium in their opening match. Remember this is the Early stages of Belgium's golden generation, the Courtois, Hazard, uh, Lukaku's, uh, Vertonghen, you know, uh, and all these folks. Um, then they went on to defeat Korea 4-2. Then drawing 1-1 with Russia meant that Algeria was also through. So Nigeria and Algeria were both through. The first time in African history, in the history of the World Cup, that two teams had made it to the round of 16. In the round of 16, both teams just fell just short, um, you know, with uh, Nigeria playing against France, right? Where, you know, they held on tight, but, uh, and their goalkeeper Vincent Nyama was incredible. But Paul Pogba of France scored in the 79th minute. Then a Yobo, Joseph Yobo, uh, on goal right in the 90th minute, eliminated them. And Germany was playing against Algeria, and it was a great match that ended up 0-0 after 90 minutes. Then Schürrler of Germany scores in the 92nd minute. My man Ozil, Mesut Ozil, scores in the 119th minute right at the end. And uh, Abdul Mumene Jabu of Algeria scores in the 120th minute to restore some dignity. So they ended up losing 2-1. But again, their goalkeeper had also been fantastic. So both teams are eliminated in round of 16. At this tournament, however, even though Ghana was eliminated in the first round, Asamoa Gian, the villain from the earlier uh, tournament, became Africa's all-time leading top scorer at the FIFA World Cup, having scored six goals in three World Cups, which exceeded Cameroon's uh, Roger Miller's five goals the 2018 world cup ah this might have been the worst one in recent history for african teams it saw the early early elimination of egypt who were back in the tournament morocco and tunisia all three north african teams lost their first two games and they were eliminated early nigeria also lost their first group game against croatia then they won the second game against Iceland. And who should Nigeria meet in their third game? But their nemesis, Argentina. So, you know, this will be the deciding game. However, they ended up losing the game 2-1 with uh, Victor Moses t uh, scoring first for Nigeria. Then Messi 
the blight of 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 of, of Nigeria scoring, then Rojo also scoring, uh, to to eliminate to eliminate Nigeria. Senegal won their opening game against Poland two one. Then they drew their second game against Japan two two. Leaving them needing just a draw in their final game against Colombia to, uh, to to be sure of progressing. However, they ended up losing zero one, and because Japan, who they were going, competing for the second spot with, also lost one zero, Japan and Senegal were level on points. Their goal difference, they were also plus zero goal. They were also the same in goal difference, and the goal scored were also tied. So these are the things that they used to, you know, now they don't cast lots of flip coins anymore, right? So the first thing, of course, is the points, which they were equal on. Then after that, you go to goal difference. Who scored the most goals and conceded the least? That goal difference was, uh, zero, was they'd broken even both teams. So that's also equal. Then after that, you go to how many goals has the team scored? They've also scored the same number of goals, four. And then you might also talk about the head-to-head -head result. Who won, even though they have the same points, who won when the two teams met? And again, they tied. They tied 2-2. So what do they do here? They go to um, fair play, right? Which is to say they'll look at your disciplinary record as far as yellow cards and red cards. And whoever did better there whoever had less red, yellow cards and red cards, less fouls, they qualify. It was the first time ever that this had been used. And Senegal becomes the first team ever to be eliminated this year, uh, this, 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 this way, having received six yellow cards compared to Japan's four over the course of the three games. So just a little more discipline, they could have qualified. But that means in 2018, there were no African teams at the World Cup. Now we come to 2022. I know this video has already been very long, but because this is the most recent World Cup and it's a, it's a, it's a pretty incredible one, allow me to go into a little more detail here than I have been doing in talking about this World Cup, if you will. So, 54 <laughs> virtually all African teams enter the qualification process this time. We've come a long way, ladies and gentlemen, from one team qualify, uh, entering the qualification process and, and, and none really qualifying for a long time. To three, to seven, to 17, to 24, to the 40s, now fifth, every single African team set out to qualify for this tournament. And of the five teams that qualified, we had Senegal, right, one-time quarter-finalists, okay. Tunisia, the first team to ever win a game at the World Cup back in the day. Remember, we've come a long way. Morocco, the first team ever to make it to the last 16. Cameroon, the first team ever to make it to the quarterfinals and Ghana who have also been to the quarterfinals and came within inches of uh, of that crossbar to making it into the semifinals back in 2010. This was also the first World Cup where all five African teams were coached by African coaches. We've come a long way. Remember in 98 it was all European coaches. Aliou Sisse of Senegal who had played in that 2002 team right that made the quarterfinals rigobert song of cameroon remember we spoke about him earlier he is the guy who earned the first person to earn two red cards at the world cup in 94 and 98 jalel kadri of tunisia otto ado of ghana and walid regragi of morocco now that's the guy let's talk about this Senegal, in Group A, played uh, the Netherlands in their opening match, and they gave a good account of themselves, but they ended up losing 2-0. Now, before the tournament, a lot of people were, 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 were saying, 
Senegal is going to go the distance. If any t African team is going to go the distance, Senegal is going to go the distance. And a large part of that is they were buoyed by Sadio Mane, who just that year had finished second in the Ballon d'Or in the player of the uh, World Player of the Year charts uh, next to Karim Benzema of uh, of uh, of um, of France. But Sadio Mane gets injured just before the tournament, and you could tell the air. Now t these teams aren't made up of one man, but you can tell the air just deflated from the lungs of Senegal, and everybody was rooting for Senegal. Rem Senegal at the beginning of the year as well had won the African Cup of Nations. So they are the reigning African Cup of Nations at this point. They are the darlings. So they played well, but they just didn't have it in them, and they lost 2-0 in the first match to the Netherlands. They performed better against the host team Qatar. Not that like that took a lot, because Qatar was pretty abysmal. And they won 3-1 in that tournament. And they found themselves needing to beat Ecuador in the final game to qualify, which they ultimately won 2-1. Right, so they had two wins and qualified second in their group, just behind the Nether the Dutch, and they set up a, 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 sec a last round, last sixteen match against England. They had also become the first African team to win two games in the group stages since Nigeria in nineteen ninety eight. But when they played England, it was a step too far for them. England was they it was was on fire. In fact, England would go on to go toe-to-toe -to -toe and within a penalty shout of def defeating France in the, in the, in the quarterfinals. So England, you know, the Harry Canes and, the, and, 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 and so forth, they end up uh, defeating Senegal convincingly 3-0. Jude Bellingham had the game of his life. So Senegal is eliminated. They had a good run that took them to the, to the last 16, right? Tunisia in Group D. <laughs> Remember Tunisia, my favorite team as far as these things to talk about their record. They drew 0-0 against Denmark. And Denmark were, were highly rated before the tournament. But once they started, you could tell they were woeful. Tunisia should have won that match. They drew 0-0. They lost 1-0 to Australia. Which again, mind blown. Australia, a lot of people were tipping them to be the whipping boys of the, of the tournament. But they did their thing. 1-1-0. One, one, and so Tunisia goes into the final match, needing the final group match, needing to beat the world champions France and hoping for a draw in the other match. Tunisia scored the upset win that they needed. Um, right, So they won that match 1-0. But Australia and Denmark uh, did not draw. Australia won that match uh, against, uh, against Denmark. So Australia qualified. But again, see, see these results, 1-0 loss. I mean, 0-0 draw, 1-0 loss, 1-0 win, <laughs> right? Sounds about Tunisia, all right? But, you know, they did beat France, and that was an incredible result, and they were within inches. If only they had beaten Australia or Denmark, right, they would have definitely qualified, but they, it was too little, too late. Now, Cameroon, ah, Cameroon was, was hard to watch. Oh, by the way, before the tournament, Cameroon is coached by Rigobert Song, but also the head of their FA is Samuel Eto'o, someone who usually features alongside Didier Drogba and George Ware and their likes in conversations about the greatest African players of all time. He's the head of the FA, and he had predicted that Cameroon and Morocco would play in the World Cup final with Cameroon winning. Speculative. Speculative nonsense, but, you know, I could see what he was trying to do. But in any case... Um, that's a huge boost, huge, huge uh, hopes to live up to, right? But Cameroon come in and they play their uh, their first match against Switzerland and they lost 1-0. And what hurt most is the Swiss player who scored against them, Rio Imbolo, is actually of Cameroon origin. In fact, his father still lives in Cameroon, such that there were reports of people going over to his father's house in Cameroon and, 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 and making a ruckus after he had played a hand in defeating their team here uh, you know but he's Swiss now you know his mother moved to Switzerland and uh, he plays for the Swiss team so they lost 1-0 they should have done better in that game the following game was against Serbia which has been described as a ding dong game Cameroon took the lead then considered two goals in the first half 
uh, injury time. So they went 2-1 down by the break. Uh, then Serbia scores a third goal. Right now they're down 3-1. It's looking really bad. My man Vincent Abubakar, who's the captain, by the way, but he's been on the bench. He comes in in the 60th minute or so, and he scores an, an, uh, an incredible goal, right? One of the goals of the tournament to bring it to 3-2. Then he has an assist to bring the game back to 3-3. Incredible game. So this left Cameroon with a total order of defeating Brazil. No African team has ever beaten Brazil. So they're going against Brazil. And surprisingly, they did go on to win... Uh, they actually beat Brazil with Vincent Abubakar scoring an injury time goal against Brazil to win the game 1-0 before he got red carded for taking his shirt off and getting his yellow uh, second yellow card that way. However, so Cameroon became the first team to beat Brazil in, in, you know, the first team at all to beat Brazil in a group stage match since 1998 when Norway did it. And also just the first African team to beat Brazil in a World Cup ever. Um... But it was to no avail since uh, Switzerland beat Serbia. So it became Serbia and Brazil who made it. No, Switzerland and Brazil who made it to the second round. So they comported themselves well. Ghana's first two matches, moving on into Group H. Ghana's first two matches saw a lot of goals. You know, uh, against Portugal, right? They ended up losing 3-2. Then in the second match against South Korea, Ghana were leading 2-0 at halftime. South Korea pulled both goals back in the second half only for Ghana to score a third uh, 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 goal immediately after that and win 3-2. So they'd lost 3-2 against Portugal, then won 3-2 against Senegal, I mean against uh, South Korea. So that's a lot of goals. This left them in second place in the group before their final game against Uruguay. That rivalry I was talking about that got initiated. You know, they've had their rivalry with the US, but the real animosity exists between them and Uruguay from the 2010 World Cup. So there we go. They have, they have to win or draw against Uruguay to go through to the second round. So Ghana is awarded an early penalty, which is taken by Andre Ayo, who is the only remaining player from the 2010 World Cup. Why Andre Ayo takes this penalty, I have no idea. He is aging he's the captain but he's he's aging he hasn't been on form he takes the most meek penalty ever and it's saved and uruguay scored two goals before half time then south korea defeats portugal in the other match meaning that both uruguay and ghana are eliminated but there was wild celebrations like i was saying from the ghanaians because if uruguay had scored a goal or had been able to equalize they would have made it over South Korea, but the fact that Ghana kept them down to just two goals and they didn't qualify either was cause for much celebration from the Ghanaians, but they didn't qualify either. Now, I know what you all been waiting for, Morocco in Group F. Although they were drawn in a group with Croatia and Belgium, right, and remember Croatia were the finalists in 2018 and Belgium, they, those two teams had come second and third in the previous World Cup. And Canada was also in the group, right? Canada, is there. they haven't been to the World Cup since 1986. But there's high hopes because there are people like Alfonso Davis of Bayern Munich, Jonathan David. So they could be on. They could spring a surprise. But the World Cup starts and Morocco draws 0-0 against Croatia. They're on to something. Then they defeat... Belgium 2-0. Now, Belgium, remember, this has been a golden generation, right, for the past 8 or 10 years, right? But it's really falling apart at the end. They are fighting among themselves. Then, so just a draw for Morocco against Canada would have been enough. And uh, by halftime, Morocco is leading 2-0 against Canada. They end up scoring an own goal, Morocco does, to win that match 2-1. But that means they have two wins and a draw. They qualify. They only considered one goal in the group stages. And it was an own goal. So their defense is looking very, very tight here. Morocco thus became the first African team to go through, the, through to the group stages unbeaten since Senegal in 2002. 
Um, and Morocco had done it as well back in 1986. Um, and the second African team to take first place in their group twice, following Nigeria doing it in 94 and 98, and Morocco as well in 1980, following their own exports. Morocco seven points, the two wins and one draw was a new African record as well. Nigeria had had six points in, in, in 94 and 98. So that means they are through to the last 16. And who is waiting for them? It's Spain. Spain and Morocco. You already know the, rela the historic relationship between Spain and Morocco. But a lot of the, Spa of the, a lot of the Moroccan players uh, play in France, but some of them play in Spain including Bono, their goalkeeper, who plays for uh, Sevilla, and a couple other players. This is one of those matches where Spain ne had nearly all the possession. They dominated the game, playing that tiki-taka style that Spain is so uh, synonymous with. Then the game finished 0-0. Again, Morocco's defense, impenetrable, right? Didn't concede a goal in this match as well, and it went to penalties. And after the first three for each side, Morocco were 2-0 up. All three Spaniards had missed their penalties. Morocco's fourth penalty was scored by Asraf Hakimi, a player born in Madrid. <laughs> and he knocked Spain out of the World Cup, sending Morocco to the quarterfinals for the first time ever. Incredible. And in the quarterfinals, Morocco were to play another team that they've had historic squabbles with, a fellow Iberian, uh, you know, a fellow Iberian Peninsula uh, inhabitant, them and Spain. And just like in that, in that, in that Spanish match, Portugal also dominated uh, possession. This is Ronaldo's last hurrah. They are going for it. In fact, Ronaldo comes off the bench. He is benched for 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 this Ramos guy who had played very well against Switzerland. Morocco is trying to catch them, right? They're dominating possession. Morocco is trying to catch them on the counter. and But a couple of chances fell to Yusuf and Nasiri, and he missed a couple of them, but he scored just before halftime to give Morocco the lead. And Portugal were unable to force an equalizer. Even though Chedira of, of Morocco was dismissed in, the, you know, in, the, in injury time for a, for a second yellow card, saw them reduced to 10 men. Morocco held on to their 1-0 lead and became the first African team to reach the semi-finals. And remember, they still have not conceded a goal by another team. They've only conceded one goal in this tournament. That's their own goal, right? So they go into the semi-finals. How much of Western Europe can they take? They are drawn against France. And France... Morocco's fairy tale journey comes to an end as Tio Hernandez and later on Rando Colomuani score to defeat them 2-0. Um, this was the first time actually in those games that Morocco actually dominated possession against the French. Um, but uh, maybe they should have they should have let France dominate possession like they did against France and, and uh, the, Spain and, and Portugal but they ended up losing this game no shame and then they would go on to play in their third place playoff against Croatia where they lost 2-1 to the Europe to their European opponents and thus finished fourth in the tournament up until now when FIFA ranks all the teams Ghana had finished seventh in 2010 that was the highest place team by an African team but fourth is incredible, 
right? They made it to the semifinals. And according to Sky Sports, this the following players were were in the team of the tournament. Ashraf Hakimi, Sufyan Amrabat, Azadin Unahi Un, 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 Unwahi, right? So those three players made it to the team Sky Sports team of the tournament. Incredible feat, you know, but you let other people tell it. Bono of Morocco, who was the goalkeeper, also deserves to be in there, right? And a lot of the other players, the likes of Ziyech and, and Nasiri, also played very well, um, even though they may not make the, the final cut for the team of the tournament. What does this all mean? Going forward, the World Cup will be expanded, and based on the performance of Morocco in this recent World Cup, and Senegal as well making it to the second round, as well as uh, some of the other historic performances, when the World Cup is expanded to 48 teams from 32, Africa will have nine spots going forward in the World Cup. Nine spots. So we look forward to that. We look forward to seeing uh, a more robust African rep representation. Uh, I trust that countries like Morocco, maybe even Egypt, who came so close to hosting the World Cup last time, Morocco more specifically, may be bidding again soon. The next World Cup is in North America. Then after that, I'm hearing of a good bid by, uh, a unified bid by Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and those countries. But Africa may be back on the, on the, on the block soon. So hopefully in the next decade or two, we see the World Cup coming back to Africa. And perhaps an African team to win it. Pele, the great Pele, may he rest in peace, had, 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 had predicted that an African team would win the World Cup before the end of the 20th century. He was wrong, but some of the performances we've seen have given us a lot of hope. So going forward, we, fingers crossed, uh, noses scratched, and wood knocked on. We hope to see Africa thrive in the World Cup going forward. Thank you so much for sticking with me. I know this has been a long video. It's been a passion project. I really appreciate you, and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, make sure to like and subscribe.